to the One Life Podcast, where we talk about things from One Life Church, but ultimately things we think can relate to you and your one only life. I'm one of your co-hosts, Sarah Inman. I'm joined, as always, by co-host of the One Life Podcast and our lead pastor, Brett Nicholson. How's it going, Brett? It's going okay. I mean, we're on the post side of Father's Day, and yeah. I know you're particularly close to your father. I am, okay. yeah. Yeah, it was a good day. It was funny. I had planned to go visit him. Um, and then, so like 15 minutes before our first service started, I get a text from my brother, and it says, hey, I know you're probably busy, but can you please call me? Which oh no you read yeah, a text in yeah, serious right and so I step out of a meeting because we had our last check meeting before our service started and uh, I called him and he's like hey uh, I have to run down and pick up a bathtub I was thinking about bringing dad is that okay and I was like <laughs> yeah that totally could have been a text too so <laughs> that was uh, but it was good they came down and we had we had uh, just lunch and went to the mall I don't know there's some, well, there you something go. to that's do that's right hey man him. how about you if dad's involved with it that's a good thing yeah yeah we're we're celebrating Father's Day uh, this evening because we spent the weekend oh. on my mother, which is, ironically, that was the only weekend that we could find where every single person in our family could be there. So, yeah. and uh, dad passed away a few years ago. And so, um, but my, my kids are supposedly doing something for me this evening. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of, I don't know what's going to be either, so, yeah, okay. Supposedly, but we'll have a follow they up act like they were. So I, yeah, I have no idea what it's going to be. Yeah, the anticipation. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Exactly. That's right. I don't know what I'm walking into. Um, and we're joined today uh, by Jeff Bunting. Jeff is the Director of Global Operations at Uncharted International. Jeff, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Hey, I'm honored. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Um, so I always have people kind of introduce themselves a little bit, tell us something about you. Um, obviously, a little bit about Uncharted uh, would always be a good a good start. So tell us a little bit about Jeff. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, briefly at least, uh, to not bore you too much. But um, I've been with Uncharted for about eight years now, and before that, spent uh, around 10 years as a pastor and church planner uh, here uh, in the Evansville area. Uh, spent some time in Tennessee and in New Mexico, but uh, I love what I could do now. And so it's, uh, you know, for, for me, for my personality, passion, that sort of thing, uh, there's nothing I would rather do than what I could do for Uncharted. And so it's a lot of fun, challenging at times, but a lot of fun. And um, Uncharted's a great organization, and, uh, you know, you talk about carrying out the Great Commission, and uh, we say, you know, we, we exist to help multiply churches and multiply disciples in overlooked and forgotten places. And so mm. oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes that means uh, we work in some pretty difficult places and come alongside people in tough situations. And so today, you know, we'll talk about Myanmar, and that's certainly true there, and, but it's a, it's a cool thing to be going to be part of for sure. How long, how long have you been in Uncharted? A little over eight years. Eight years, well. Yeah, and in the course of those eight years, you think about the overlooked and difficult to reach places. Jeff has seen all of it. I mean, the, it's 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 has its uh, amazing levels of challenges. It's got a lot of rewards, but um, it's a very interesting ride that he's and he's had a front row seat to the whole thing. And so there's a lot of, and I just appreciate you're still sitting there. I'm glad you're still loving what you're doing too. Yeah, so that's that's a good thing because sometimes the problems can pile up to where you might not want to sit there yeah so so i'm glad you're still there yeah me me, me too and in a lot of ways i feel uh, strangely enough um i i kind of relish the opportunity to to do hard things and Hmm. uh you know there have been certainly challenges uh, all around the world but uh, i feel more at home and more engaged and more excited to be part of it than uh, than i was eight years ago so that's excellent. It's the name of the game right there. It's inspiring, honestly. I mean, to, to think about, and even the topic we're talking about today, we're talking about the country of Myanmar. Um, and some people may know some of the things going on. Some people may know nothing. Maybe they've never heard Myanmar before. Um, can you start off just giving us a little bit of the history and background, not only of Myanmar, but Uncharted's uh, connection to Myanmar? Sure, yeah. And I'll try to do that without going into a whole lot of detail. Sure. But um, f- I think in 1948, uh, Myanmar won independence from the Britons, so they were a British colony for a long time. But that really didn't last very long. And uh, the, the elected president was overtaken, uh, was over, overthrown by a military coup. And that military ruled pretty ruthlessly for several decades. And what was a fairly, um, fairly wealthy, a, a pretty solid country became one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, it was really just a, a difficult dictatorship. And then... Uh, around 10 years ago, it became a, began a pretty significant transition towards democracy. And so it's not like all the problems just went away overnight. Um, but over the course of a decade, uh, things changed dramatically in terms of uh, international investment, in terms of openness, some degree of freedom of speech. And um, just to have a conversation with somebody on the street, um, 
you know, within a year or two of that, that initial transition, it was like even people's outlook on life, their, their whole personality changed because they just the, the weight of that dictatorship, the weight of the oppression was, was lifted and continued to be lifted. But then um, this, uh, this past fall, they had another election and uh, the democratically elected leader who had been in, in power for, for some time was elected by a really wide majority. Um, you know, it was a landslide victory. Uh, but the constitution that was in place allowed the military that was in charge before to maintain hold on a certain amount of power. And that constitution was written in such a way that at least in their minds, uh, they had sort of this loophole to be able to seize power. And so somehow, uh, without anybody really being the wiser, uh, overnight, uh, there was a coordinated effort uh, by this military all throughout the country um, to detain a lot of the elected officials um, and basically seize power overnight. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there was, there was hope in the immediate aftermath of that that this you know, wouldn't last long and that it wouldn't be like it was before. Uh, but in the in the months since, it's uh, the situation's really deteriorated, and so it's been a terrible situation that's worsening all the time in terms of the brutal tactics the regime is using to try to suppress any sort of dissent. And along with that, you know, that's uh, exacerbated a lot of existing problems and created a lot of new ones. And so it's a it's a tough place to be, and um, uh, just a really difficult situation for people who who are there in a lot of ways. And we'll talk more about that. Yeah. So Uncharted, actually, and I remember when we first started going, that even before Uncharted existed as an organization, there was groups of, and teams going f um, from Evansville over there, and that was when the, uh, the military was in control. Yeah. And then we watched the freedom come in, too. Hmm. And I remember the development, all of a sudden it was. It was like everything changed, like a new day, like our prayers been answered in the whole nine yards. And, and uh, we saw the development on the other side of that. And so this came as a kind of a brutal shock. And you said just kind of out of nowhere, there wasn't anybody, no one was the wiser. So it wasn't any warnings about any of this? Yeah, some, some rumblings, I think, uh, a little bit of concern, but I think the country had, had moved so dramatically in the last 10 years that nobody thought it was possible. And so, you know, there was talk of, well, the military may try to do this, but there's no way they actually would. Um, wow. You know, the country's come too far. There, there are too many beneficial things in place. There's no way this could happen. And then um, even before they thought it would actually happen, uh, it, it did. And uh, initially, I think within Myanmar, there was a lot of thought that, you know, surely if, if uh, you know, these peaceful demonstrations, if we get enough people to rally in the streets, and if, as the military begun cracking down on, on those protests, you know, if, if there's enough international attention that's, that's focused on Myanmar, surely the international community will step up and, and force this government out of power, put enough pressure on them that they can't continue these tactics. And uh, there have been a lot, of, uh, a lot of words, a lot of um, you know, things that have been said by the international community, we condemn this, this is inappropriate, uh, but nothing that's really had the teeth to, to change the situation. And so that's only emboldened the military, uh, only emboldened the regime to continue some of these same tactics. Are the, are the protests still happening? Or is that gone? It, in some ways, they are. It looks a lot different. And so in the early days, you know, you would have thousands, uh, maybe even tens of thousands of people right. on the streets protesting, you know, just like you would see a lot of places around the world. Um, as the bullets started flying and, you know, some of the, the really terrible things started happening, understandably, people, people stopped that or at least slowed down. And so mm -hmm. protests are still happening, but not anything on the scale they are. Okay. And uh, overall... Uh, areas that have been uh, where that's become a lot more common, where the protests have continued to to be uh, a more common common thing, the mil military has focused a lot of their oppressive action on those places. And so there was one uh, one small city in particular that uh, was kind of seen as a hub for a lot of anti anti regime mm -hmm. behavior, and uh, that for all intents and purposes, that town. I won't say it doesn't exist, but nobody's there. Very few people are. And oh, so wow. they've, they've hammered it. Uh, lots of people have lost lives. Uh, lots of homes have been burned down. And so, you know, the, the military is doing anything they can to make it clear that, you know, if you, if you stand up against this regime, it's not going to go well for you um, on a personal level and then on a, on a collective level, you know, even down to, to, to a, a location, to an area where mm. these sorts of things are, are happening. Is is the I mean the, obviously I mean 
people can look for this information on their own, but like, is the purpose just for power? I mean, they just want to be in con- back in control. Is it the same group that was in control years ago and has kind of come back and wants control again? It's largely the same group. I mean, I'm sure some of the people are different. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the names are different, but it's it's the same basic group. And, you know, you can look anywhere around the world where things like this this happened. We're somewhat insulated from it here in the U.S. Um, you know, when, whenever we hear about these sorts of things, it's typically somewhere far away. Right. And it's easy uh, to kind of know that it's happening. You know, we might see a, a news headline or something, but uh, it feels distant because, quite frankly, it's a lot of miles away. Um, but in, in, in this case, you know, who, who knows why people do what they do? But oftentimes uh, it has to do with, with power. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe there are other ideological uh, reasons behind some of it, I can't say. But I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, what this group and especially what the leaders of the group have to do uh, to maintain the power that they have and to get more. I remember when the freedom first hit and, and, was, uh, and, and the country was opening, I, it seems like I remember discussions of, you know, companies were coming in there, you know, Coca-Cola mm-hmm. was going to set up a thing yeah. there and all those kinds of things. So that did happen, I'm, I'm assuming. Now, is the current regime, to your knowledge, trying to push all that out? Or are people running away? Or are they trying to seize some of the prosperity that was gained or any feel for that? Um, somebody who, you know, works or ha- really has a, a window into the business community could probably answer more definitively. But, but my sense is, you know, a lot of that progress has stalled because, you know, what, what company wants to invest in a situation like what, right. what's happening now? And, you know, through the, the civil disobedience movement or just the messiness of what's happening, you know, there are lots of industries that have slowed uh, for a long time. A lot of businesses were shut down. Um, some factories have been bombed and burned down and things like that. But overall, um, the impression I get is that the military, not only do they not want to, to put a damper on those things, they want everything to feel as normal as possible. Like they want life in Myanmar to be a new normal that legitimizes their power. And so... As long as companies are shut down, as long as businesses aren't able to operate, um, that that brings their legitimacy into question. And so the more they can kind of force the situation to feel normal by forcing banks to open up, by forcing schools to operate, um, in, in their mind, that's legitima- legitimizing their place as, as a rightful you know, governing body for the country. Can you talk about um, some of the ways that Uncharted and just people... Uh, from the tri-state area, have been involved with the country Myanmar, some of the things they've uh, been connected to and you've seen really grow in the last 10, 11 years. Yeah, yeah, really. And uh, to, to tag on to what Brett was talking about earlier, Uncharted, in, in some shape, form, or fashion, even before we were the organization we are today, uh, we were birthed out of a local church and in, in a lot of ways a, a kind of a grassroots effort w- within mm-hmm. that church where um, hundreds, even uh, you know, well over a thousand people from from this area, from the Evansville area, um, spent what left part of their heart in Myanmar, and uh, what largely was invested in uh, relationally, especially over time, was uh, children's homes and um, efforts at church planning. And so we we still to this day um, have really close friendships with with a lot of those same people from from twenty plus years ago. Um, but there are a lot of kids who have benefited and a lot of people in the kingdom uh, because of the work of the influence, the support of people here in this area. And so it's been, it's been cool to see and been neat to see, um, you know, the impact that people within the tri-state area can have on a, a set community, you know, eight, 80, 400 miles away or something. And so it's, it's pretty yeah. profound, really. Yeah, um, we're even sharing some stories this morning of people who've obviously, you know, been impacted and continue to be impacted by people that they're connected to yeah. um, in Myanmar and support in Myanmar. And I know that's something that, you know, again, I think we say this, it's like what you're, what we're trying to do. And even in this conversation is like, you know, we can say this in a church and again, people see something like, Oh, that's far away. Like that's something that I'm not connected to. And we want to continue to create the conversation so that we realize that you are connected to it. Cause we are, are all uh, one body of believers. We want to continue supporting um, for you guys as uncharted um, and connecting with the people that you love um, that you're connected to. How difficult has it been to get information and connect with them? At different times, it's been really difficult. Um, sometimes it hasn't been that difficult. And so I think that's just maybe a product as much as anything of the ever-changing, ever-evolving situation. And so, you know, early on in February, maybe early March, um, our friends who were there were posting freely about uh, 
some of their own civil disobedience, you know, attending protests and things like that, that's all been scrubbed uh, from their phones, wow. from Facebook. Um, they were sharing pretty freely with us about just what life is like, what they're, what they're seeing, how they're feeling. And um, in the time since then, there, there have been, you know, certainly some, some frank, honest conversations uh, that, that have been shared. And, you know, everybody in Myanmar uses Facebook. And so it, it's a pretty common way for them to even to share information with each other. You know, we would, we'll send text messages to each other. Um, they'll use Facebook for a lot of those same things. And so uh, there's times, even, even today, I saw a couple of things that were posted that, that kind of caught me off guard a little bit from, you know, that's, that's kind of bold of them to, to be that honest given the situation. Um, there have also been times when I have uh, sensed a hesitancy to say hardly anything. And so um, I jumped on a call with, with one of our friends one evening and uh, uh, we did a video call and I thought his camera was turned off. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's nighttime and you know, it's completely black. And then I see uh, sort of this faint silhouette of him in the background and someone has turned on a, a phone flashlight that illuminates him just a little bit. And he comes up to the camera, he wanted me to see him and then he you know, went black, back dark and he comes up to the camera and speaks very softly and explains that uh, he, he's in this campus with a bunch of kids that, that he and others are caring for, and there's a few other adult leaders, and they're gathered outside um, after dark just keeping watch um, in imminent fear of the military or of uh, you know some posse of bad guys kind of storming their campus and wreaking havoc. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, you know, at least one or two of them were staying up all night every night just keeping watch so they could, you know, sound the alarm if uh, they needed to all run and hide somewhere or something to that effect. And so he, he would barely raise his voice above, above a whisper and was hesitant to say much at all. And so I just listened as best I could. I mean, mm -hmm. what in that situation, uh, you know, what can you say? And especially when someone's on the other side is afraid to say something for fear of being heard, I don't want to say something that then comes through on his side that you know right. might, might be problematic. And so, um, and actually the, those, same, those same folks, um, it was several weeks after that, but the very thing that they had been fearful for uh, happened. Yeah. And uh, a group of military and police um, climbed over the wall or busted through the gate at night and uh, three people on their campus um, were beaten pretty badly uh, with steel steel rods and things like that, um, seemingly for no good reason other than because one group has the power and they don't. And so, you know, they'll check phones for any evidence of, you know, anti-regime behavior, things like that. Um, they're not aware of anything that prompted this. Mm. Uh, so it's it's tough and it's, you know, they're living living in fear. So, yeah, I was, I was wondering how much the daily life of the average person had changed in light of that. You just kind of painted a picture of that. And so that is normal. Like, I'm always on the watch, um, and I may, and all I've got in defense, I guess, is to hide. I mean, mm -hmm. Is that what people did in that case? In, in, as much as they can. Right. Um, you know, for a long time, the banking system was shut down, but that was largely uh, an effort to oppose the military um, by just putting a stopping the flow of traffic, the flow of funds. Uh, today, those things are back open, but you know, people were waiting in line for eight or ten hours to get one hundred and fifty dollars out. That's the max. Um, it's a little different in other parts of the country, but uh, for a lot of our people, um, they're they're afraid to leave their house um, for fear of being stopped, for being arrested arbitrarily. Uh, for being interrogated for having their stuff stolen, uh, and so something you know as simple as going to uh, going to the store to get some food, um, you know, running a basic errand, uh, they feel like they're kind of taking their life in their hands. Mm -hmm. And you know, there there are a lot of stories of somebody who uh, you know was going from point A to point B. They were stopped at a checkpoint. They were taken to the police station and interrogated for eight or ten or twelve hours. And sometimes that's all it is. I mean, it's not pleasant. Nobody wants to do that. But what really is concerning is there are also stories of that same thing happening, but then the person just never making it home alive. And, you, and nobody knows what transpired. Um, you know, having whatever they have with them confiscated, uh, you know, things, things like that. And so it really is living in fear. And one of, our, one of the guys we work with actually posted a lament uh, mm -hmm. that I, I thought was pretty impressive. He posted it on Facebook uh, this morning, our time that 
uh, I, I thought it was really moving and, and honest. And you know, at some point, I'm happy to share that on this. But yeah, that'd be great. Uh, just kind of gives his uh, his thoughts and feelings, you know, as he's living through this and thinking about himself and thinking about the other people in his life. Yeah. Is yeah. is any of this? Um, I mean, you said it's specific more towards a different regime. Is any of it religious focused? M- my impression is not a lot. Um, Previously, when the military was in charge, and, and I think we've seen a little bit of this, and maybe we'll see more, um, any minority group was at greater threat of you know, different types of persecution or just poor treatment. And so, um, to what degree, you know, it's hard to say when things are so chaotic and terrible, you know, to what degree is that based on yeah. the fact that someone's not the majority religion? Um, I, I think it, it probably comes into play to some extent, but it's not that that's not the primary, uh, you know, the primary reason. But I'm, I'm assuming in the primary religion is, is Buddhism, mm-hmm. but I, I, I would take it probably your average Buddhist and even those in the temples and everything are probably getting the same treatment. Is that fair to say? They're, they're afraid to walk down the street that's as right. well. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah that would be, uh, so there, these guys are not driven by that ideology, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. It is just military and it's power. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, well, feel free to share the lament because I would yeah. like to hear because it puts us in touch with um, people that are experiencing things. And, and again, I, I, I think it bears repeating that these are people that um, uh, we know, but and a number have been here. Uh, they've visited mm-hmm. One Life specifically and other churches and have been a part of life in the tri-state and we've had dinner together and all the rest. I mean, these are actual relationships that we have, yeah. not, just a, not just a mission, but it's, it's actual family. So Yeah, that's right. He titled this fear, living with fear, sleeping with fear, waking with fear, standing with fear, sitting with fear, eating with fear, going out with fear, dreaming with fear, and he has an exclamation point, thinking and waiting, when are they going to come, to arrest, to destroy, shoot, or kill, who knows, would I be able to protect my family, my children, or myself, I don't know, I really hate living like this but I am living in it. What would be the best choice to make? I don't know. I look into the eyes of my little boy. He has a, a kid who's just a few months old. I feel sad and take deep breaths. Would I be able to protect her? I don't know. Even if I die for her, would that make her life safe? It is still uncertain. I wish this, be a, I wish this would be a bad dream, but it is not. Even the dogs in the community haven't slept for days and nights crying for peace. And then he says, really hope and pray to end these terrible things in our country. Dear God, please have mercy on our people. My goodness. That's kind of unfathomable in a, in a way. Um, and, and that's, you know, the, the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders that they would bring peace. Cause that, that's what we're asking for. Yeah. And we take it for granted. And when you spend time in countries, and there's another country we serve in through Uncharted that hasn't experienced that. And it, it is fundamental it's like life doesn't even work unless you have that one element of of -hmm. safety and some level of peace and uh you just heard it and i've never heard it that uh that firsthand before in my life till this moment yeah it's a lot of raw emotion and just real real feelings of you know uh, powerlessness Uh, you know all this is happening around them and you know obviously they're thinking about themselves but thinking about all the people that they don't have the power to protect like right. they want yeah. to. And even questions of, you know, the next generation, what, co- what comes next? What's this look like six months from now or five years from now or, you know, on down the road? I was thinking about that, you know, generations that haven't lived with this and it's new and yet they kind of had this maybe hope, you know, for future. And it's like, I, I can't imagine what they're feeling right now. Um, if, if is that different? You know, younger ones may be like, is this normal? Um, and then people that maybe have experiences in the past, may have these just flashes of, of flashbacks of maybe their their yeah. younger years. And it's scary. And, and you read that, I'm like, man, there are so many things. This is not trying to personalize it for us by any means, but there's so many things that we disagree with. And then people have disagreements here, and it's like they just seem insignificant 
mean, mm-hmm. compared to something like that. I mean, that's real. That's happening. Not these ideas of things that someone might do to us, but those things are really happening right now. And that's a real example. Um, Jeff, you know, we have people ask all the time, you know, if, if, as we've shared things through social media. And, and again, you know, we're, we've tried to <coughs> ask people to follow um, the newsletter that you guys are sending out mm-hmm. updates through unchartedinternational.org. Uh, you can find information there. Um, what can people do? I, I know that's the question that people want to ask because people want to do something, yeah. but um, what, what can they do? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I always appreciate when people ask it. Uh, I think that the hardest part, uh, I'll get to a, a real answer for that question in a moment, <laughs> but I, I think the hardest part is, you know, I, I've in tears, you know, had this conversation with, uh, with one of our friends, you know, I, I feel so powerless to help. Like I have these deep relationships and, you know, they're pouring their hearts out and th- there's nothing that I can say. There's nothing I can do um, that can just make this better. And that's, a, that's especially true. You know, when there's a natural disaster, you can, you can organize support to come in and you, you have this material need that you're trying to address. Mm. And it may be difficult. It may be an insurmountable problem, but, but it's something that's different than this sort of situation that, that's so hard to even wrap, you know, for me to wrap my mind around because of the human element of it in terms of who, who's in charge and who's creating the problems. And so there, there's a degree of what, what can we do and, um, and, and helplessness. But I think I, I truly don't mean this to be sort of the cliche Christian thing to say, but the number one thing our friends and, and people we, we talk with in Myanmar, the number one thing they ask for it is truly for us to pray, to, to intercede, to intercede for them. Um, you know, we, we can't, we collectively in Evansville or even, you know, the believers who care about Myanmar are, are it's probably unlikely that we're able to, to make the, the, the tides change in terms of the leadership of Myanmar, at least not in the short term, um, not, not directly, but we have the ability to, to intercede and pray to a God who has, has the ability to do all things. And so, you know, when I think of, of our friends, um, you know, things I'm praying for is, you know, to start with just that they're protected, that God would even supernaturally protect them from just the terrible things that are happening around them, from people who want to do them harm uh, for whatever reason, that God would protect, um, that he would provide all the things that, that are needed. So right now, um, money's not worth what it was. It's hard to get it. Um, uh, there's talk of food shortages, something around 15 or 20 percent of the country is food insecure. And so, you know, provision is a very real thing. And and I think that situation will get worse as the country becomes more isolated and more cut off from the outside world, uh, which which could certainly happen. Um, You know, you heard talk of even the dogs not sleeping. Uh, Another recurring theme that I hear over and over whenever I have conversations with our friends is you know, this weighs on them. It's, it's every moment of every day, at least in the back of their mind, like they can't escape this feeling of what's going to happen next. Yeah. You know, what's going to happen to me? What, what's going to happen to the country? And um, I, I can't imagine just the toll that takes on a person's mental health, on their, on their physical yeah. health. And so, you know, peace in the midst of, of the storm, of the craziness, but, but literally that they can sleep, that um, they, can, they can actually get rest um, and then for those who, you know, most of the people we, we connect with, um, they're believers and they're not just believers. They're people who are passionate about seeing others in their country know and follow Jesus. And so for a lot of them, they've actually been doing some pretty cool ministry in this time. We had 34 baptisms among oh, our wow. group, um, last month, which is one of the, oddly enough, and missed all of this, mm-hmm. it's one of the biggest months for baptisms in the last <laughs> few years, uh, which... Wow. Is that much more impactful to know that in the midst of all yeah. of this, uh, you know, with that as a backdrop? Um, but even as as all this is happening and they're fearing for their safety, they're very intentionally finding ways to serve um, and to share Jesus with others. And mm-hmm. so, um, just the, the the ability to, I think it's Matthew ten six that talks about being uh, wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. And so, you know, to not just be uh, you know, careless in how they go about living life, uh, to be, to be wise in it, but also to be bold and faithful in, in following Christ and serving other people in the midst of it. And so praying for those things. And, uh, and I think beyond that, you know, we are, we're we're 8,500 miles away from Myanmar and it's hard sometimes 
to see the personal element of it. You know, you, you hear a news story and it's this number of people had this bad thing happen to them. I'm like, wow, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. But it's depersonalized. And so, you know, actually hearing stories from real people and things that, that actual people are experiencing, I think helps. And so there are a couple of uh, local Myanmar specific news sources that I've been following. One's called Myanmar Now. And the other is called, this is actually my favorite, Frontier Myanmar. And interesting, the Frontier Myanmar, um, the guy who was, I think, the managing editor, he was an American, and he'd been there for just a few months, and he was actually detained on his way out of the country. He was detained by the military and is still in uh, a pretty notorious prison there. But they've continued churning out top-notch journalism, um, just sharing about the stuff that's happening in the country. And so I think as we, as we educate ourselves, as we learn more, it, it helps us pray better and just helps us feel a connection, especially if we already know somebody. Yeah. Um, just gives us a window into that that we can't get otherwise from you know, a typical news headline type story of all oh, this terrible things happening. Hmm. I, I know that you, I was just thinking about this and I should have asked this before um, you kind of close with that, but is there any, is anyone even able to visit right now? Is everything shut down? Um, uh, maybe there's someone able to visit. Uh, no one like us yeah. is, is able to visit. And so we, we've continued, um, like I said, continue to try to talk with, uh, with our friends. And um, actually people here in, in the Evansville area through Uncharted have helped uh, do some, some pretty cool things in terms of food distributions through, through church planters and through uh, some of their network that they have that we're not directly connected to. And so uh, just over the last probably six weeks, I think 200 different families have received um, food packages through, uh, through that. And so that's, that's another thing that people can give to as a way, kind of more tangible way to help. And we hope to oh, do more of amazing. that. that's amazing. Yeah. Because I, I, I wondered if we could get in, but even <laughs> if our, our relief organizations at all getting in. So is that how people are getting food or how does that work? My, my understanding is that even some of the bigger relief organizations have kind of been turned away, which, oh. um, quite a few years ago, I'm trying to think exactly the year. I want to say it was 13 or 14 years ago. Um, there was a big cyclone that hit the country. Oh, that's, yeah. that's back that when, when well. uh, yeah. cyclone Nargis, and that's back when the military was in charge. Then, before the move towards democracy, and you know, a hundred thousand plus people died, and the military wouldn't let aid come in because it yeah. it brought their legitimacy into question. So, some of those same things, uh, my understanding is, they're happening now. And so, even like for our people, as they you know have a neighbor that they they know is uh, you know going hungry, um, to help that neighbor not starve to death is seen as um, going against the cause. And mm -hmm. so you can be thrown in jail for it. And so as our people are doing this, they're doing it at their own risk. And so um, even though the big organizations can't get in, even though we can't get in you know, as uncharted, right. um, through these networks of people that, that we have, they're able to you know, very carefully you know, kind of tell, okay, yeah, I can, I can help this person. I can help this person. I'm not sure uh, about this one. You know? And so they're trying to do that very oh, carefully, okay. yeah. huh. very intentionally. Uh, but it's been cool to see that happening. Yeah. Um, Jeff, before we wrap up, anything that we didn't cover that you want to make sure people know or any kind of last thoughts that you would share? I don't know. Uh, just that I, I really appreciate you uh, having me on and, uh, and, and talking about this. I, I love that uh, the people here who are listening to this have the chance to engage a little bit yeah. deeper level. And um, yeah, it would be great if people want to sign up for our newsletters. Um, there are ways to support uh, through Uncharted, but there are a lot of other great organizations that are doing stuff too. And uh, truly most important, um, we just ask people to pray mm -hmm. and uh, pray for the future of Myanmar. Yeah, again, uh, unchartedinternational.org. Um, Brett, I'm kind of kind of put you on the spot, but it seems like the, the best way to close today is just in prayer. And uh, Yeah, without question. That yeah, so. that's a um, good call, Sarah. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so right. If you wrap us up in prayer. Somebody's and going um, to run this thing well. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff, that's right. thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. And um, again, yeah, unchartedinternational.org for information there. And then I'm going to put some some more of these things that, that Jeff talked about here, uh, new sources um, in the show notes as well. So yeah. thanks. Hey, let's pray. Lord, um, wow, it is really, really humbling to know that uh, like this man was just pouring out his heart in lament, which I know you honor and you, and we don't understand the whys and, and uh, what for is of all this. We don't get it. We know there's a battle. We know there's a battle in, in, in natural life, but we also know there's a, lot, a, a battle in the spiritual realm as far as this goes that the four countries, especially like Myanmar, that experience these kinds of things. And right now, uh, there's, uh, there's been a counterattack, and you know that. And so I pray that you will give that peace. Thank <laughs> you. 
uh, for that country. I pray for the international community. I pray for those in leadership who could bring relief and who could uh, delegitimize what's going on over there. I pray that they'll step up, that you'll just uh, inspire a leader out of our own country or somewhere around there to do something significant on a geopolitical level that would bring relief. Uh, but we pray in the meantime for those brothers and sisters that we know there. I pray that they will have that peace and they will have that sleep that Jeff was talking about. Uh, that Just imagine being so frightened that you, you can't sleep or you can't get rest and not even the dogs are. And Lord, you told us to pray that we would live peaceful and quiet lives. And so we ask according to your will for them and on their behalf. And I pray that you'll deliver them from evil. And I pray that you will just calm this and you will rest uh, away uh, power from those who are abusing it and using it to you know even keep relief from getting to people who need it. Uh, that's it's just flat out evil. And so we pray that uh, evil will not prevail in that country. Deliver them, help them, encourage them. But also I know that people are coming to be baptized because everything's been yanked out from under them. Their foundation has been gone, uh, lost. And so, Lord, I pray that you will continue to do that. Uh, I pray that it won't be the only way that people come, but I pray that you will just give boldness and, and sureness of word and uh, clarity to those who are willing to step up and, and, and speak. And I pray that people will receive it so that there will be a groundswell of your kingdom rising up and expanding in that country. And we're certainly going to give you glory for it when we watch it happen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Guys, thanks so much for listening. Um, again, if you, uh, as always, if you're here at this point, we'd appreciate if you maybe share this conversation with someone else. I think it's a great conversation to continue to have and want more and more people to be educated on it. So thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. And uh, we'll see you again next time.